My name is Melanie Pesco, and I work with the APH Connect Center, specifically with our Vision Aware website. And today we will be bringing you practical steps to independence when you are new to vision loss. And we are going to have some wonderful speakers that will be sharing some information that is going to be very, very useful today. Um, I first will introduce you to my colleague and co-lead for the Vision Aware website, Ms. Pris Rogers. And Pris, if you want to take it away and introduce, introduce our guests, that would be lovely. All right, I'd be glad to, Melanie. Thanks a lot. And we're going to do something a little different today with our, our webinar. We haven't been describing ourselves, so we are going to be doing that. So I'm going to introduce each one, and then each person that, that I introduce is then going to describe themselves, and then we're going to go on to the next person. So uh, I am an older white woman with brownish hair, emphasis on the ish, and um, I have a, a pink blouse with a, a dark blue jacket on. And, um, and I'm ready now to introduce Mary Bell Steele. And just a minute ago, Melanie was talking about how she, Melanie, I mean, uh, Mary Bell is just starting her day. And the reason she's starting her day is that she lives in Melbourne, Australia. And Melanie, uh, Mary Bell has been a vision aware peer advisor for many, many years. Uh, she lives in Australia with her partner and tech wizard, as she puts it, Harry, and her guide dog, Dindy. And she's a writer and award-winning speaker an author of Blindness for Beginners, among many of her other <coughs> creative ventures. She has uh, written on his pigmentosa and she was diagnosed at 17. But as she says, she uh, has a, an attitude of a positive, I can do it approach. So uh, Mirabelle, I'm gonna turn it over to you to tell them a little bit about what you're wearing, and what you look like. Thank you, Pris. So I am a 60 something white woman. I have shoulder length, dark brownish hair I think depending on the color I have used I'm wearing a light floral top and I'm wearing my favorite necklace which has amethyst and pink crystal and I have blue eyes thank oh, you I forgot to say I have glasses and blue eyes so there you go <laughs> okay now we're going to turn it over then I'm now I'm going to talk about Marana Brandenburg who is also a peer advisor for vision aware and Marana is a personal trainer and a nutrition specialist and her goal is to help people help themselves by teaching them about proper nutrition and fitness. And she's helped many individuals from various walks of life and backgrounds along their health and fitness journey. And Miranda has also done some work for us on diabetes. She has diabetes herself and she has done some, a great webinar for us and written a post uh, about her experiences. So Miranda, you wanna talk a little bit about yourself? Hey guys, I am Marana. I am in my early 40s. I have shoulder length blonde hair that is now pulled into a ponytail and blue eyes. I am a white woman. I am wearing a black tank uh, because I was doing a workout prior to coming on here. So I look like I just walked out of a gym. <laughs> That's great. You look perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and now we're going to I have the only male we have on the show. We're going to talk about him. His name is Jeff Thompson. He is an audio engineer, a media producer, and founder of the Blind Abilities Podcast Network. He's a member of the Minnesota Wild Blind Hockey Team. I don't know what that's about. He can tell us. And teach advanced and beginner woodworking. He is an activist for inclusion access, and a warrior for blindness awareness. Jeff, let's talk a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm a white male. I have dark brown hair and I have green eyes. Last I checked, hazel, green eyes. Um, just turned 60 and I'm glad to be here. <clears throat> Great, we're glad to have you here. And next, I'm going to introduce Amy Bovard, who is also a Vision Aware Peer Advisor. She's an upbeat author who is visually impaired and an experienced world traveler. She's written several books, uh, including ones like Mobility Mat Matters, Kane Confessions, A Lighter Side of Mobility. She has retinitis pigmentosa and is legally blind. And she worked as a specialist in legal language acquisition for nearly 30 years and traveled to Latin America, Southeast Asia and the Middle East. 
and she views life as a personal adventure. So Amy, let's talk a little bit about yourself. Yeah, it's good to be here. I, uh, I have short brown hair, I'm 60, and I am wearing earrings that are look like ruby colored square earrings. And I have a lime green shirt blouse on with a necklace from the Philippines. So, oh, wow. Here. So you're really international in your dress. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's great. And lastly, we have Neva Fairchild, who is the National Aging and Visual Law Specialist with the American Foundation for the Blind. She has 30 years of, of professional experience in vision rehabilitation and a lifetime of personal experience living with vision loss. She's worked at AFB since 2008 and oversees the training and activities of the fellows and mentors in the AFB Blind Leaders Development Program, which, by the way, I think is open now for applicants. Um, so she's worked for the state of Texas and also at the Dallas Lighthouse for the Blind, and she's currently now president of the Association for Education and Rehabilitation of the Blind and Visually Impaired. Now that's a mouthful for you. So Neva, talk a little bit about yourself. It took me the first five years of my career to learn to say that. I am a 60-ish <laughs> white woman with shoulder length white hair that's in a French braid today. I'm wearing my uh, queen bee earrings with a black shirt with white stripes and a tur turquoise nugget necklace. And I'm talking to you from my home office in Dallas, Texas. Thank you, Pris. Well, thank you, Neva. And now, Melanie, I'm gonna turn it back to you to get us get that show on the road. Yeah, absolutely. And I apologize, I forgot to describe myself I am a white woman uh, in my late 40s. I have very short red hair. Uh, I'm, I don't really know what color my eyes are, <laughs> I'm ashamed to say. Um, and uh, I have on um, dangly earrings that I, I think maybe are floral. I'm wearing a black shirt. And um, gosh, and I come to you from Louisville, Kentucky. So um, today we want to get things started and Pris, thank you for those introductions and all of you for your descriptions. I think that is a really um, useful piece that um, I hope that you guys, our participants, uh, find that useful. I know I do. Uh, so today we wanted to share with you guys um, some really practical things that you can do both uh, in your home, outside of your home, in your uh, just in your daily lives to begin to um, take steps toward independence because in the beginning, especially with vision loss, um, you know, it, it can be very overwhelming and confusing and, and finding where to start and how to start can be daunting sometimes. So we have some people with us um, who have been there and done that, got the t-shirt and they have some words of wisdom that I think that will all be um, very, um, pleased to learn about. So you guys, I wanted to kick things off by talking about um, living and working and being in our homes when we're new to vision loss. What are some things, um, and you, any, any of you guys can start us off, that's fine, and we can kind of just go round robin. Um, what are some things that you would say are easy uh, first steps or adaptations that people can make in their homes just to make it easier to navigate with low vision. Who would like to start us off? I'm happy to. Great, Maribel thank you, here. Maribel. Well, if we're talking about navigating in the home, if you have some vision, what I like to use are um, lights around the place, as in lamps, but lamps with LED lighting, so they're not expensive, they can stay on, they don't get hot. And what they do is if I place it near on the top shelf of bookshelf or somewhere that's quite strategic, I can follow that little beacon of light, which will help me know where the door is or which direction I'm going. So that's a very simple way of just bringing some beacon lights into the house. But the other thing I wanted to say as you were talking there was 
that the first thing I would be doing is just being careful of where we have ornaments because it's lovely to decorate our home and I love you know blue glass and things but just be aware of tall ornaments that you might want to keep them at the back of a shelf or a bookshelf something like that mm. just so that you don't knock it over with your hand when you wave your hand it's very easy to break something oh I, I've done that. <laughs> I think all of us could probably <laughs> relate that. to that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Who else? Do you all have any any other ideas around things you can do in the home? Yeah. I would. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Jeff. Jeff. Um, one of the ideas that comes to mind is training the family as well, like in pushing chairs in when you leave the table. Mm. Um moving like tv trays some people use tv trays or something to put that back or especially when amazon or some other parcels come in in the doorway so everyone has an understanding that you just don't bring it in and set it down anywhere you kind of put it somewhere or out of the way out of the walkway so keeping walkways and furniture yeah. clear is very important for me yeah for sure I would add to that, always making sure that if you open a door, you make sure that door is closed yes. because getting your head caught on the corner of a door is never any fun and you're going to forget that it's open. Making sure that you don't have like coffee tables. I get rid of coffee tables completely. Anything that could be a trip hazard, just making sure like Jeff said that your pathways are clear. And also that people pick up after themselves. I know there's only so much that you can do, but you know, a glass of water or a glass thing left on the counter can really be a pain if you're constantly spilling stuff, knocking things over. Oh, right. yes. I, and also thing shoes. I can <laughs> you know, if you're going to kick off your shoes, keep them under the couch or in a little basket yes. in the door. It's like you say, it's tidying up behind you. It's eliminating those obstacles. And the other thing is closing cupboards as well. Don't leave a cupboard oh. door open because I think we have all hit our heads and things on cupboards. So as Jeff said, once the family knows these rules, it does begin to make life much safer within your home. Yes, I agree with that. And it's, and the drawers as well. I have dropped, I've knocked myself over drawers, high drawers, and dropped um, brownie batter inside the drawers, <laughs> hit my head on the microwave when I left it open. So that was one of the first things I learned. And the other thing is, uh, they talked about keeping your aisles clear. I remember early on, before I kind of got things straight, tripping over suitcases. And uh, so, because I couldn't see things below my knee. So that was really important for me to get them out of the way and put them in a place that I wasn't gonna trip over them. So, yeah. Sure. I think all of that speaks to clearing up and decluttering, yes. which is a big um, push these days, especially for those as we get older. Um, we tend to have a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff we don't need anymore and don't use anymore. And really it would make our lives so much simpler to, to um, uh, friend it to someone else or donate it or sell it and, and just clear up the walkways and so that there isn't something sticking out everywhere. I try to make uh, straight walkways that I can trail with my fingers. I I turn my hands so that my fingers are bent, kind of like I'm holding a, a can sideways or something, but my fingers are bent down. And, and so that if I hit something like a doorknob as I'm trailing along the wall, my fingers will bend, not get jammed. Mm, and that helps me to did, move did you know, more freely. Did, did you know that also eliminates putting fingerprints everywhere? <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's right. That's not the dirty part of your hand. That's right. Yep. Yeah, you know. Do any of you use, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I was just going to say, Miranda, Miranda talked about, I think it was Miranda talked about shoes. When, no, Mary. Mary Bell. Mary, Mary Bell talked about shoes. Uh, if you have pets, a lot of people have these little balls or bones or gnarly things that are around, but typically that something like that, you really don't want to step on because usually if it's a ball, you're going to find out real fast or stub your toe on them and stuff like that. So I have a basket where I keep my shoes, but also for the pet toys, when I find them, they go back in there and they kind of stay put a little bit. So training the rest of the family to do that as well helps. 
exactly yeah. yeah can can you train my dog to put his toys back in his <laughs> box though that's the problem i'm having yes you can <laughs> Oh, I'm being facetious. I know. I, know. I haven't taken the time I'm to being do serious. You can train know. your dog to put their toys away if, if yeah. you need them enough. Yeah, I, yeah. Adage, a, a place for everything and everything in its place really helps when you can't see. And this does go to not only your own personal habits, but your family's habits and those you live with or those that visit you. Um so that I always know where to expect the remote control to be. There's a basket on the end table. So those kinds of things go together. Um, when I walk into a room, I always put my phone down. I have decided on a place in every room where I'm going to put my phone down because there's nothing more frustrating than I walk into a room, I lay my phone down, I'm ready to leave that room, I can't find my phone. Yeah. Um, even though I can say, hey, Siri, and sometimes she answers and sometimes she doesn't, or I can have my Amazon Echo call my phone, and then as long as I didn't have it on mute, I'll hear it ringing, I would just rather reduce my frustration level and be more efficient by always putting it in the same place and knowing where to go get it. Very but awesome. Melanie, can I just add what I'm hearing Sorry. that we're all saying is that we're, we're mindful of what we're doing and yeah. that's what I think we need to do when we've got when we can't see so as we make an action do an action put things away we're mindfully going I'm going to put that there so it takes a few extra seconds to remember I'm putting my keys back now there I'm putting my phone over here and that mindfulness is something I think we train ourselves to do yeah. yeah getting prepared to That's do really something i just so wanted getting... to add to that oh, hang on one yeah. second amy i think jeff was in oh, the middle sorry, of a jeff. comment that's okay yeah you guys are reminding me when we talked about this before we got started uh a couple weeks ago i actually changed a few things that i do because you guys made some great points and one of the things i brought up was uh i call it a launching pad it's like when i gotta go skating I got to make sure I have everything in a row. So I started putting everything in one spot. Like, here's my phone. Here's my keys. Here's this, that, the other thing. So when that Uber ride surprised me and comes in three minutes instead of the typical 12 minutes, I'm ready because it, it's all right there. And just like you just mentioned, like, where's your phone? Where's your keys? We all have to do that. So I've started the new thing that I started doing is right by my uh, – jewelry box, whatever you call it, the little chest thing on my dresser. That's where I'm starting to put everything when I'm not leaving, but when I'm home. But when I go to leave, I know where to go get it, retrieve it, and then I get it, like I call my launching pad, pre prepped and ready to go. Oh, what a great idea. Amy, what were you going to say? Oh, just that with different levels that there are things that hacks that can help you. I, uh, with my breakfast bar, I have uh, for uh, quite a long time, I had a a noodle uh, that I put around it so that if I bent over, then I would hit the noodle instead of instead of my head, my forehead. Okay. Or sometimes I covered like a football player, like I covered my head if I was going to go down to a different level because I couldn't see the the top. Whereas if I saw something on the floor, I would pick, go to pick it up, and I wouldn't see the the other level. So I had this noodle that protected my head for quite a while. That was very helpful for yeah. me. I have a couple of comments I wanted to share. I did just see when someone says that Jeff is not able to be heard very well. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't know, Jeff, if you're able to adjust your mic. Um, someone does say they agree that pets will train themselves to stay out of your way. And then this is actually another comment that I wanted to bring up because I wondered about how many of you use rugs and or recommend using rugs because someone in our audience says that scatter rugs or small mats are a hazard for the visually impaired and older adults. And I wonder um, how, how you guys feel about that and uh, what do you suggest? I agree wholeheartedly. Tripping hazards um, are problematic, especially as we age. Um, and so I have, I have a mat inside my front door, my back door and my garage door. And those are the only scatter rugs I have in the house because um, of, of tripping. The ones in my bathroom are um, 
actually wooden bamboo mats so that uh, they, you don't get your toe caught on them. You kick them, they move. Um, and, and the ones that I do have by my doors have rubber on them. So they are, uh, are slip proof mm -hmm. and they don't curl. Yeah. I have a slightly different approach to it. I think if the rug is a heavy, solid rug, then it's okay to have it by a bookshelf somewhere that you might not be walking through the room, but it's over by something. I also do keep a rug under a coffee table, but our coffee table has round corners. So, and I just know that it's there. Um, I think it does depend on the rug. If it, it, it's that you don't want it moving, it's got to be solid. And I too have something by my front and back door because it helps me navigate to the door itself. So I think it is a personal thing, but definitely not near the top of stairs or something like that. And they sure. do say use solid colors rather than say pattern colors. So I think that also depends on your sight loss, what you can see. For those of you that do have some vision, how do you, uh, and Mirabelle, I know you talked about using some lights as beacons. What about uh, contrast? Do, does that help uh, using high contrast any? Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially in the kitchen. So mm -hmm. I, I use the combination of a light source near my, on my kitchen bench, uh, like a lamp, and then colored boards, chopping boards, depending on what I'm cooking mm. with. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And contrast is easily achieved no matter what part of the house you're in by just adding something to the environment, like a bright colored pillow on your sofa if it blends into the carpet or the flooring or the wall, or a throw over the back of a chair, or towels that contrast. And even though I know my mother's rolling over in her grave, your bathroom towels do not have to match. <laughs> if the ones laying on the countertop, you would see them better if they're dark, then get dark ones. And if your walls are dark and light towels would look, uh, you know, would show up better, then you can use light towels in the same bathroom. It's okay. The bathroom police will not be there to get <laughs> That's right. <laughs> What other adaptations, are there any other adaptations that you guys can think of that maybe, um, maybe not necessarily your home specifically, but in your, uh, whether maybe it's outdoors around your home in, in your garage. I know Jeff, you, you probably could share a little bit about the garage and outdoors and things that you do to sort of make it a little bit more accessible for yourself. I think the most important thing is, someone mentioned it a little bit earlier, is putting things back exactly where you keep them. Because yeah. next time you go look for it, you don't have to spend 10 minutes looking for it. And I will spend 20, 30 minutes looking for it just for the fact that it's not there. And I wonder where it is. Another point that we have snow up here sometimes, and there's snowstorms sometimes, and you may get dropped off the bus, but the path isn't always carved out for you. No one's reclaimed the territory yet. So I have an air tag at the front door. It used to be a tile, but now I switched over to air tag. So someone could actually, I haven't had to use it because this is my home, but actually we've had an experience with a snowstorm once where Lori was down the street <laughs> somewhere yeah. looking, looking for the entry. And so an air tag of that nature, we use that for Jeff, camping can I, too. Can I ask you real quick to explain a little bit about what an air tag is for those who may not be aware? Sure. An air tag is from an, it's an Apple product and it connects up to your iOS device. It's, it's not a tracking device, but you can find it. So if you lose it, if you lose something, if you hook, I got one in my wallet and two on keychains, And so if I need to look for it, it's just like when you're summoning H here S person to look for your phone. Uh, it does it with the air tag and it also has a uh, location when you're close to it, it'll say eight feet, seven feet, six, five, four, it'll count down to it. So this locating device, you could put at a strategic point, especially like we go camping and stuff and we have a camper. So we have one on the camper itself too. Just, you know, you might get mm -hmm. turned around sometimes and stuff like that. But, but can that kind of like a beacon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You can also use sound for um, locating uh, where you are outside wind chimes that um, make uh, you know different pitched noises. Uh, 
high pitched tinkly ones in the backyard and low pitched uh, ones in the front yard. Um, yeah, it doesn't work if the day is very still, but most of the time they're making some kind of noise. Sure. Uh, and, you know, having a radio on, like when I'm swimming at my daughter's house, I like to have the, um, the sound of the radio on one end of the pool, the shallow end of the pool, so that as I'm out in the middle of the water, I know which way to orient myself mm -hmm. by sound. Oh, that's a great idea. That's, yeah. yeah, that is good. The other thing I do in the garden, like Jeff said, is putting the trowel and the broom and everything back in that place. And it's the family need to follow that because mm -hmm. it is very, it's very confusing. Someone says, but it's over there, which is only maybe a foot away, but it's not where I expect it. So it's putting it back, having a system. Yeah. And I, I think some of this lends itself to, you know, sitting down and talking with family, especially if you're new to vision loss, about the things you're struggling with. And uh, when you figure out what they can do to help you right now, you may not even know what to ask them to do. But at some point, you'll know things that, you know, if they would do some of the things we're suggesting, it might help you. And so you have to open that door and have that conversation. And you can't expect them just to intuit what you need. You have to you have to be bold and say what you need. It does help, especially for those of us who follow like really strict, very rigid diets to see about maybe asking them, is there a certain shelf in the refrigerator that can be allocated for the stuff that I eat and stuff? Because I mean, there's no more, nothing more frustrating than when you go and you try to find something, you have to search for it every single time because it's gotten moved and misplaced and stuff. Or even, you know, asking, is there a specific cabinet or something where that I can have where I put just my stuff so I know where to find things every time I go in there to find them. For me, for instance, I'm diabetic. And so if I'm having a low blood sugar problem, I need to know exactly where my juice is or where the things are that I need to help, you know, fix that issue. And whenever you're having a low blood sugar and stuff, you really kind of are in a panic and don't have really the right state of mind to be searching for stuff. So um, having them in the same spot all the time is, is really helpful, but getting others to, to others to cooperate is really the key. Sure. I think um, Miranda brings up a really good point, but I wanted to first, Amy, I think you had tried to say something or oh, am yeah. I mistaken? It's just that uh, just with like in the garage, I find it it's quite difficult to see uh, because of the lighting. So what I do is I have those, those uh, you put them by the garden and they, you put them in the sun and then they, they stay lit. And I oh. have a, a flower pot and I put like three of them in there and some stones so I can always see like where, where it is at the bottom, you know, the, the shelf and I can kind of orient myself. And I do that also around the walkways so that I know exactly where they are. I just put them at intervals and, uh, and they've been in the sun if, most of the time so that they're bright and I can okay. see them right away. Yeah. Excellent. Melanie, so, that reminds me of something just on that thing. Um, I keep fake white bouquet of flowers, so plasticky flowers, in the front garden, just you know, pop, popped into the ground. But it means that I can see that colour white and I know that's where I'm heading towards for our front stairs. And I can also take them camping so I can identify our tent among all the other tents because I've got this white bouquet of flowers by the side. Oh, of the I tent. love that idea. Oh. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I Marina use, start. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. I, I use a <laughs> rubber clown nose. It's bright red. It was uh -huh. not one of my favorite colors, but since I've lost most of my sight and I have periphery, red sticks out now. So I kind of like red. So this rubber cloud nose goes on the end of this mic stand that I don't use for a microphone, <laughs> but I hang my headphones on them and I can pick that out. So it's. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that it's it's interesting how some things that we didn't really think about before now are suddenly useful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Um, how do you guys uh, organize yourselves in the in, in the kitchen specifically? I know we've talked about various rooms and we've talked about, um, you know, different ways to navigate around your home and make your home more accessible as a whole. But in the kitchen, do you have any specific, not only just about organization, but tips and tricks about being more independent in the kitchen? 
I have a, um, a variety of techniques I use in my kitchen, including uh, braille labels on some of my canisters, mm. um, way around tags, which are uh, text tags that my iPhone reads the text that I assign to that tag and they come in magnets, which are on my canned goods and stickers, which are on some items that um, don't get replaced very often, like my coconut oil that feels just like my jar of peanut butter. And it's not that I can't open that, those two things and tell by sniffing which is which, but when I dig through the pantry, pull it out thinking it's coconut oil, open it up and get a whiff of peanut butter, it's like, oh, great. You know, yeah. now go put that back and dig out the other one, you know. So it just, it just makes it faster um, and, and more efficient. And I, I'm really into reducing frustration. I think the, the less frustration we all have in our lives, the better off we are. And so some of those things I do, and, and we already talked about the organizing the refrigerator, the eggs go in a particular spot, the milk goes in a particular spot. I no longer buy orange juice in a one gallon jug that feels just like a milk jug because orange juice on Raisin Bran does not taste very good. Oh, done um, that. <laughs> yeah. I've, also, I've also just given up orange juice because it's, because it's just, you know, not good for me as a uh, you know, as a, as a, a blood sugar <laughs> booster, but sure. I do know that there are reasons why people want juice in their house and I get it, but if I get juice, it's certainly not in a matching container. I think that's one of the things I've learned to avoid is, is matching containers. Well, and along those same lines, I wonder what, um, what really simple things do you use to label things for people who may not know Braille yet? or may not have access to way around or, or some of the tags and things. What are some real simple, practical things that people can do? Well, Melanie, funny you should ask. <laughs> I have beside me a pen friend. I'm and what is up. a pen friend, Maribel? And a pen friend is a, a six inch device that is like an audio labeling system. So it comes with a variety of stickers that are like a barcode. So in a way, it's like your own personal barcode reader. But you can record things onto what I do is in the kitchen, I have spice jars. And like Neva said, yes, of course, you can open them and smell each one. But it's much simpler if you label them with the audio device. So I'm going to show you what happens when I put my pen friend on top of the spice jar, which has already got a label on it. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. ah, chili flakes. flakes. And then this one? Coriander seeds ground. Coriander seeds. So I can go straight across all my spices once I've labelled them all, but you can change them and you can also take this device anywhere in the house. So you could label anything, tools, makeup, whatever you feel you need to put a sticker on that you can retrieve quickly tins of um, food or whatever you use the pen friend and I do and that. do you buy the the stickers that can you buy extra packs of them or you can, can you, you use can them? yes you do you buy extra packs but it does come initially with um, a book of stickers and they're all different shapes so not only can you you can feel then it's a round one a square one depending on if you want to maybe use square ones for savory food round ones for sweets you know you can design your own system but I do love the pen friend. It's a very easy tool and you could take it with you and record people's phone numbers. Like it goes way beyond just the kitchen. So it's a, a wonderful device to have. But the other thing I was just going to show you, I'm holding up. Um, these are, I don't know you get these in America, but they're like rubber, big rubber bands with different tactile markers on them. So we get these in from a place here called Vision Australia, but they're different colours and different bumps. And these, if I do happen to get someone's bought a matching orange juice jug to, you know, the milk, I could put one of these around the orange juice or something. And they, again, have different tactile bumps and you can devise your own system to label tins of food, shampoo bottles, whatever it is you need to feel quickly. So they're just a couple of things I use. 
Okay. We did, actually did have someone in the chat talk about rubber bands and paper clips. And, and yeah, I think that's some of the things that I use the most. Are, anybody else have any simple I use, ideas? I use tape. So, you know, a lot of appliances these days have buttons, not necessarily like a touch screen, a lot of them are touch screen, but they also have buttons that are kind of flush with the surface so you can't really tell. But like on the dishwasher, I'll put um, just a small piece of duct tape over the start button. So I know once it's loaded and I get this open, I just feel for the tape and push that to get it started or I'll mark certain buttons on the um, on the microwave or on the oven so that you just have, I mean, you can use the, the Braille bumps as well, but even just simple duct tape that's a little bit rough that you can feel it helps out a lot with being able to, you know, recognize buttons and stuff. Mm -hmm. This is Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Um, sometimes I, I've used magnets on some cans um, here and there that, they're really nice because you can take them off and put them on the next one. Like if the corn is in a row of cans of corn or whatever you have, you can just take it off, put it on the next one, because then you can identify that from something that if you have green beans that doesn't have any marker on it, then you can distinguish that. I also use, um, what do you call them? Clothespins. Um, mm -hmm. They're quick and easy. Like if you have Doritos or something else, I mean, yeah, you can always open them up, but it's so nice that, the clothespin one is this or the other thing or that uh, other thing. The other thing I found out that I do is I find out that I do like I just discovered myself. Um, Sam's <laughs> Club, we, we buy things in bulk and they always get these cereals with two packages in it. So I always take them out anyways, but I do it now to the single packages because I can reach up in the cupboard and feel the bag and tell, oh, that's Cheerios, or that's a flake, like a mm -hmm. special K or something, or if it's squares, it's golden grams, something of that nature. It's easier to decipher rather than th three boxes. So that's something Absolutely. that I do. We've gotten uh, a lot of comments on this topic, so I wanted to share some with you guys, and, and you can elaborate on any of them that you like. Um, someone says, um, a mini glue gun to make markers for uh, ovens or stoves, washer dryer, microwave. So I thought that was very really interesting. I never thought about that one. Uh, foam or foamy stickers. They are generally waterproof and you can use them for, um, let's see, marking cans and bottles. And it works for shampoo and conditioner because they're waterproof. Uh, contrasting, I like this one, contrasting colored tape for edges of shelves and counters. I like that a lot because sometimes, you know, it, sometimes for me, and I don't know if this is the same for any of you, but my countertop is just close enough to the shade or the color family to my floor. And um, I have definitely meant to put something on the counter and I sit it down and there is no counter there. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else talked about bump. Uh, let's see, bump ons, I, I guess bump dots is what I know them as, uh, felt tip marker, markers, tape, tactile stickers, um, magnet, mag, magnets, um, remove labels on keys such as tomato, uh, I'm not sure what that meant, but um, Dollar Tree has double-sided dots, packages of 240, if you need small dots for, to mark some things. Oh, wow. And uh, let's see. Oh, and someone says, how do you, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, it just okay. jumped around on me here. Hang on one second. Um, how mm -hmm. do you guys operate the stove and oven as a visually impaired person? And hang on, let me just make sure that we're not missing anything. Puff paint, glitter nail polish, notebook, whole reinforcements feels like a donut and they stick well. So those are some other good um, tips. But yeah, if, if you got and so we are going to be having a webinar in August, I'll give you the, the first, um, first sneak peek here. And it will be all about being in the kitchen and how to do that as someone with uh, low or no vision. But I would be really curious, we can veer into that topic for a moment if you guys want to share about some of the ways that you are independent in the kitchen. 
The adhesive dots that someone mentioned are usually sold at the hardware store. You can get them through blindness specialty catalogs. They call them bump dots. They call them lots of things. Uh, tiny ones are lock dots. Bump dots come in tiny sizes and great big sizes, depending on what you can feel. They come in different shapes and colors. I prefer clear because I've cited people in my family that want to read what's underneath that bump, but that's what I put on my microwave, my um, oven and stovetop controls and my dishwasher controls because none of those things talk. And um, I, I think it's very important to use a strategy for using the bumps so that you don't put a bump on every single button. You put them on the ones that you use the most. So believe it or not, you can cook almost everything on popcorn. Um, you don't have to set two minutes and 32 seconds. You can just hit popcorn twice. Uh, my microwave happens to have a thing where it's it, there's a button that puts 30 seconds on. And so if I need eight minutes, I'm pressing that button 16 times. What's funny is my husband is sighted and he has no problem typing in 800 start, but he uses the 30 second beep, beep, beep button too. You need a clear so that if you have to stop it in the middle, you can clear it so you can start it again. And then um, I also have a, um, a bump, which my microwave is also my vent hood. I have a bump on my vent hood so that I can turn that on. The only two uh, buttons on my microwave that are marked are the 30 second and the clear um, because I'll I don't want a whole bunch of buttons to try to figure out which one do I want now, you know? Yeah, that's so interesting that you say that because I thought I was the only one that just really loved that 30 second button, but I'll, I'll tap that thing 10 times if I need to. <laughs> How long do we cook stuff? You know, it's not that long in the microwave typically. Sure, sure, yeah. I have a air fryer that has those buttons that all you have to do is basically come near it with your skin and it, it's, it's activated. So mm -hmm. it doesn't take pressure. It just takes electrical contact from your skin. So what I've done is put that above and below, like one side is the temp where mm -hmm. it'll go arrow up, 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 or down, down, down. And I know that it starts out at a certain temp. So I just find that bump and I just go below it and tap it five times. Then on the other side, there's the time and it starts out at 14. So if I want it for 17, I just go below that bump over there and tap it three times. So I'm not actually labeling the buttons themselves, but what I'm doing is labeling their location so I can identify it. That's right. You have to test that before you put the bumps on because you're right. My dishwasher and stove works the same way. If I put the bump on top of where I need to touch, it won't work. Right. Good point. Good so point. what I use on my oven is just one dot, but it's a Velcro's. So it's a soft feeling one that has a sticky bit to it and it sits on where the point for an average, but uh, sort of average oven temperature. So that's for me, 190 degrees C. And then I will just move the dial because it's, it's a dial um, according to that particular button. I'll go up or down from that. Just, and I, you just tend to get to know where, think, you know, use it enough times, you do know where to move the dial. As well on my gas, obviously I hear the gas, I smell the gas, and I can use, turn the buttons um, according to how I've got used to using the stove. Real quickly, um, and, and again, we'll be having a more in-depth uh, webinar about this in August, but I wonder if you guys can share about some of the things you do um, to actually, how do I say this, to actually use the stove in terms of keeping yourself safe? How do you make sure that you don't get burned? Or how do you make sure that your pan is on the eye of the burner? And can you share any of those things with our audience? I always I feel where the burner is prior to setting the pan down before it gets hot and make sure that it's centered before I put anything on it, making sure that the handle is not going to be in the way of other flames on, on other burners. If you're going to be using multiple burners at once and also really controlling your heat, you know, not cooking everything on a high heat. So it's, um, you know, like maybe a medium heat so that it's, you're not burning things and, and stuff, really paying close attention to the temperature and stuff. And just trying to keep all the tools that I'm going to be using 
you know, like wooden spoons or spatulas or whatever right there close so that you're not having to walk away and then kind of come back and reorient your re reorient yourself and, and stuff, making sure that I've got everything right there, all the tools that I need so I can get everything done straight away and not have to worry about messing with other stuff too much in between. Miranda brought up a great point there, especially the handles of your pots, whether you have a Dutch oven or whatever. I always face those away from where I'm standing at the stove. So someone, or if I reach down to get something out of the bottom of the stove or the oven or something, I don't catch that handle and flip it or something like that. And once you're, if you have to do stuff on the stove, like stir it and stuff, you can always check afterwards while it's cooking. You can kind of Take your hand above it and you can feel like if you're off in a crescent moon of the, it's glowing, if you have one of those flat surfaces, you will feel excessive heat coming off of one side more so you can more center it. Um, that's that's what I found out works for me. Absolutely. And also that's where you can bring in your extra lighting. So I definitely have a lamp that sits near my stove and it has a pointing downwards light uh, and that helps me move things off the stove put it onto the board next to it but bring in extra lighting if you if you can see and just using all your senses in that way to be cooking talk more about that using your senses um in and, and we've talked a little bit about that with um using your hearing to find your your um location you know your home but in what other ways do you use especially your hearing your smell and your touch um, just to be more independent inside and outside the home? Well, one thing I, I, because I do love cooking, I do, and people think that when they start to lose their vision, this is something they have to stop doing or give up. It's actually not true. You just develop different ways. And for instance, if you're cooking meat to make spaghetti bolognese, you can feel through your wooden spoon as meat's starting to brown. It just has a particular texture to it. Undo. You're not putting your hands in it, but you, you get to feel things are drying out in your pan. I love using dishes that are just a big one pot um, so that I can be using that pot and not having to move from too many different dishes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, your, your sense of smell and the touching and taking things off. For instance, if I need to flip an omelette, I won't do it on the stove. I'll take the pan off the stove, put it by my light, give it a minute just to cool down slightly, then use a spatula, do a little flip, then put it back on. So yeah, it's just, um, that's just, yeah, just using all your senses to, to incorporate into your methods. Maribel, you bring up a good point about lighting again, and I, I'm glad because so many people don't realize how much good lighting can do them. It really takes some experimentation, and it can be as simple as a, as a desk lamp that you, you know, that you get at the dollar store and different types of bulbs. I agree that LEDs are, are great because they're, they're inexpensive to run and they don't get hot, but if you don't have one that is the right uh, intensity for you, you may have to experiment with several different, or you may have a compact fluorescent or a, um, even a, an old incandescent bulb sometimes is what's needed, but also experimenting if you can get a light that will allow you to make it dimmer and brighter, because sometimes you need brighter light, um, but if you have that bright light in, at night, um, that may be too much light because sometimes too much light is as bad as not enough light when uh, you have low vision. And especially if you're um, a bit um, light sensitive, excuse me, light sensitive or photophobic. Um, I struggled with that when I could use my vision a lot that, that sometimes too much light just really washed out everything I could normally see. I use hearing a lot when I'm cooking because if I have some form of meat on there, whether it's sausage, hamburger, or whatever I'm doing, I want more of a, a goopy sound, you know, like it's just a little popping here and there, but I don't want this sparky sound, you know, very crisp because then it's too hot. I can tell it's too hot. And even in sauces, you can hear the bubbling. You don't want sauces to burn, boil, um, or even soups, you know. So I always start... I used to always say I know the perfect temperature, but I always 
turn it to six o'clock, like start at medium. And then if I realize nothing's really happening, if eggs is on there and I don't hear any action coming, so I'm using my hearing to listen for the popping of the egg. I don't want it to be crackling because that's too hot. So that's how I set my temperatures. We had uh, a couple couple comments. Someone had a question, but I wanted to also um, talk about the comment that someone made about uh, daylight or full spectrum bulbs can also be used. And the one thing that I kind of wanted to touch on what Neva said was that um, it, it's very individual because those daylight bulbs, um, I can't see anything with those. It, it's They're so ineffective. And so I think the, the point there is that it, and Neva touched on this, is that you have to really, um, you know, just see what works for you individually, because it could be an incandescent bulb, or it could be um, a, a fluorescent bulb, and those daylight, I have a friend who absolutely loves those daylight bulbs, and I hate going to her house for that reason, <laughs> but <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that, that's not true, but someone asked a really interesting question um, that I wanted to touch on before we get into some other topics, I wanted to keep an eye on our time, we're doing good here, but I wonder, um, can you guys give any ideas about cleaning, how to clean and pick up any spills uh, using other senses or, or your vision? What, what sorts of things do you do there? Yes, you hand a sponge to a sighted member of the family and go pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I use and paper when you towels. Have... <laughs> Sorry. I use paper That's towels. That's my favorite like method of cleaning away. too, Maribel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. Oh, that's all right. Um, my my son worked in a uh, he was some form of a chef in a kitchen, and he every time I used a, a towel or something, ah, oh, you're transferring germs or you're transferring your contam you're cross contaminating, and I never really never really stuck. But then I started using paper towels because you know, like if you're handling meat or something, and you wipe your hands off. You, it, you can't just wash it off all the time. You so I. And I throw that away. Well, then now I get it. I don't want to use a towel. So when I'm cleaning, I'll use paper towels more so to soak things up and to throw away. And the other thing I do, if I have to clean something up that I don't want to smell or anything like that, I throw it into like a little Target plastic bag or Walmart or um, mm -hmm. something like that. And then I tie it in a knot. I mean, just one quick tie. Sometimes I set that out even with like banana peels or something like that because otherwise if you just throw it in the garbage it's going to be in there for how long you know so I like making sure that some things that I don't want just sitting there get tied up in that but yeah need, paper towels we need to do things very methodical too um like if I'm cleaning a counter or a table I start at one side yeah. and I work in a grid pattern I, I'll, I'll work from one side to the other and then I'll start at the top and then work my way down to the bottom and then just feel as I go along you can feel if there's residue behind you can feel you know crumbs or, or whatever and just keep focus on that area until it's clean and then move along because um you know, you don't want to just be wiping willy nilly and missing different spots and stuff. It, it just has to be done in a in a pattern. Yeah. Yeah. And like you say, putting your one hand in front, because sometimes you can wipe down a kitchen bench a little too vigorously, but then you might knock over a glass that someone's put there. So you, you are doing that grid pattern thing, but using one hand sort of in front of you, just checking that you're not going to come across something that you're going about to you know um, knock over so again it's methodical patterns what about things like sweeping the kitchen floor or mowing the grass are those things that you all have techniques for it's all grid but, pattern like yeah same mm -hmm. thing yeah, yeah. With, with vacuuming the floor I start on one side and I do small areas at a time and just work my way along just start in one part of the living room and then work your way over to the other in, in, a, in a grid pattern and I go up and down the room and then across the room. So yeah. that, That's so that um, and when my dad taught me to mow the lawn when I was a kid and, and uh, had enough vision to kind of see where I had already mowed because of the shadow and the difference in the length. Um, that's what he would have me do is, is mow both directions. And uh, you know, yeah, it takes longer, but the job is done and it's done well. I also think that sometimes going slower than you used to go or than you maybe would like to go on some of these tasks mm -hmm. helps to 
avoid accidents like knocking over things that are sitting there. Uh, because if you do bump it and you're going slower, you're less likely to, to actually send it flying across the room. Uh, it's also true when you're walking through uh, some place that's unfamiliar or some place like where you're not sure, did, did the ottoman get pushed in? Did the kids leave the toys in the middle of the floor or whatever? Um, you know, I read a book years ago about a, by a woman named Dorothy Stifel that wrote a booklet about uh, living with retinitis pigmentosa and uh, Usher syndrome. And basically she said, when she goes to the grocery store, instead of walking through the grocery store with a purpose in mind to get to the dairy case and get that gallon of milk, she strolls through the grocery store like a queen so that she's going slow enough that she catches things that her vision can still tell her about, that her hearing can tell her about that um, actually your, you know, your other senses pick up when you're close to somebody or something, if you're, if you're going slow enough and you're paying enough attention. And uh, I think that works in, in these kind of tasks as well. I'm going to have to work on my grocery store swag. <laughs> yeah, you, you might want to be going through like a count, Jeff, not like a countess. But, you know. There you go. Also, also just being aware to knowing that like if you're cooking spaghetti sauce or things, they're going to pop and, and whatever, and knowing that, okay, so the, the back, you know, the wall is probably going to have some splatter on it and stuff and just making sure to, to wipe those down and, and make that all things are covered. And this may not be a very popular answer, but just recognizing that there are going to be things that we miss and there's nothing wrong with asking. I mean, it's one thing to depend upon other people, but nothing wrong with asking for help. I mean, I clean and manage my own home, but there are specific things like mold growing in the bathroom, you know, mildew growing in the bathroom that you can't really feel that you aren't really aware that just happened because there's steam in there. So clean and manage the bathroom. But then um, my sister-in-law would come over every three months or so and just kind of eyeball it and say, oh yeah, well, some mildew has grown up in the corner over here or whatever. And it was really no big deal, but um, you know, so. So um, another another comment that we have is that you can feel dirt better with a microfiber cloth uh, mm. than with a sponge, which I, I agree with. I think that's, um, or I, someone else said about the person that uses the full spectrum bulb says she likes them for sewing and crafting. And so I'll put a plug in that anyone who crafts making your own cloths <laughs> are even better. <laughs> so, um, and uh, so, I want to switch directions a little bit. We're getting down to, um, we have uh, about a half an hour left and I want to encourage uh, folks to uh, either put questions in the chat box or raise your hands and we will try our best to get to everyone if you have questions. But um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I wonder if you guys can talk about ways that you capture information and how you retrieve it. So maybe that's a phone number or a grocery list or a, just a note to yourself, or maybe it's more than that. Maybe you're taking notes uh, during a presentation or just, and, and, and other types of information. You guys can help me out. What, what things do you do? I'll a lot say. of times. Go ahead, yeah. Maribel. No, I didn't speak. Yeah. Uh, Marina or Jeff. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I shoot myself a quick text message. A lot of times if I'm making a grocery list, I'll use Siri and just text myself. I program my own phone number into my phone so I can say text Marana and then just make a list of the things that I need from the grocery store and add to it as necessary. That's exactly what I'll do. I'll say, hey, I'll say, Siri, take a note and I'll just collect these notes. Like, especially like when you get to the store, you can always go through it, like check it before you leave, you know, just to have that. Now, tell me a little bit more about that. Um, Cause now you've got me curious. Uh, when you tell her to take a note, where, how do you retrieve it then on your phone? Is it a I voice just, recording or is it a text? I can just say open notes and it'll be the oh, last one that you that. put in there. Sometimes gotcha. it'll put your address where you recorded it from if you didn't title it yourself. So if I'm at the store and I make a note, then I'll have a different address, but it'll be at the top. Okay. 
Yes, I do a similar thing with my phone, give myself a list. But again, that's where I would use my pen friend. If I'm out and I need to record someone's phone number, um, I can put that on the sticker and take that home. The other thing I use is a digital device, which is called a daisy. And this device I'm holding up now, it's um, my daisy device. It will, it's basically used for reading audiobooks, but it also has a recording function. So I can record memos to myself on this as well. Can you describe that for us? And uh, this, the, what it looks like there, Maribel? Um, okay, so it's a device that's a, a, a smaller than a, like shaped like a mobile phone, but it's okay. about four inches by two inches. Okay. And it has a numpad on the front, like a touchpad, dials and, um, like you would be touching, yeah, notepad, sorry, numpad. And it can store up to 60 audio books that you download, which is another topic. Um, but it also has a, a way of recording memos. You press a button and it will store it to this memo file and you can go back and retrieve it quite easily. So it's a DAISY a digital device. And I, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, there are, um, we have some equivalent products here in the States. I wonder, though, if you guys can touch on what if you don't have an iPhone? I know that they're <laughs> everywhere and lots and lots of people have them. But what if um, technology is just not your thing? Can you think of any other ways that folks can um, both capture and retrieve information? I think that depends on a person's uh, level of vision. Uh -huh. uh, the, the first and easiest way is, is a bold uh, marker pen. Uh, similar to a Sharpie, although all of the blindness catalog companies have um, equivalent pens that don't have permanent ink, so they don't bleed through pieces of paper, and they don't smell bad, which that smell kills brain cells, and I don't know about y'all, but I have no brain cells to spare, so sniffing a Sharpie marker all day while I make a grocery list or write a letter to a friend is, is not something I want to do. Um, so those bold line markers can help people to be able to reprint longer. Um, you print bigger than you than you would with like a regular ballpoint ink pen or a pencil, um, but it's nice and, and dark. And there's even paper that's lined that's nice dark lines. I can remember, you know, looking as a kid for notebook paper for school that had darker lines. They just got so faint by the time I was out of school. And bold line paper is a thing. It's out there uh, in the specialty catalogs. Um, you can even print your own. If you've got a, a fancy computer person in your house that can just put some blank lines, you can print a, a stack of bold line paper. And um, I'm holding up something here similar. Can you see that, Pris? It's a template yeah. that, you, that has all, it's like it sits, sits on an A4 piece of paper. It's a plastic template and every line is has got like a window to it. So you can put that, if you can still see to write, you can write very clean, straight lines by using this template sitting on a page. That's called a writing guide. Yes, there you go. Uh, in US terms, I don't know when right. it may be called a template in Australia. I'm not saying that it's the wrong name, but no, no, that, that um, and that's it. it's a used whether you can read what you write or not. This is the big difference then, you know, sometimes you want to write down something because you need to read it later, but sometimes you need to write down something for somebody else to read, like a grocery list that you're sending with a friend or a spouse to the store, or a thank you note for a, a lovely birthday present you received. Um, and just because you can't see what you write doesn't mean you can't write anymore. Um, and a, a writing guide like that is a, is a perfect solution for those types of things. Really and then Maribel brought up the digital recorder um, that's built into her daisy player, but they make digital recorders that are simply that, just digital recorders that are less expensive. Some of them only hold 15 seconds of information, okay? very wonderful if it's right by the phone and all you have to do is record a phone number so you can call them back later or you can tell somebody that you know someone so called and here's the number not very effective if you want to record more than one number so you have to be careful what you what you buy and you need it to have simple buttons and that type of thing I like the Wilson recorder and yeah. uh, 
APH still carries that, I believe. But it's, it's just three buttons and you can't make a mistake with it. You can listen to your recordings, you can record a new recording, but you have to work at it to make it delete a recording. And that's good because that's why a digital recorder is so much better than a cassette recorder because you can just jump from recording to recording to recording and you can't accidentally record over something that was important like a doctor's appointment and the number to call and the address to make the the trip to go to. And those are the things that are built into the iPhone and the Android phones, to be honest. But if you're not there yet, or you haven't figured out how to use your iPhone with voiceover or with Zoom, then those features aren't going to do you any good. Now, we'll put a, I was just going to say, Jeff, I will put in a little plug that uh, you and your podcast, Blind Abilities, helped me learn voiceover on the iPhone when I needed it. And uh, mm. so Jeff has a wonderful iPhone 101 series um, that if you are using an iPhone and you want to learn more about how to use voiceover, I cannot recommend it enough. And you get to hear his smooth sounds <laughs> <laughs> and all his antics <laughs> he and his cohort. Go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, another thing that really came in handy for me is a note card st uh, slate. Um, if you do pick up a little bit of Braille, you can, you know, if you just learn A through J, you can take down a phone number. But, you know, basically, if you use basic Braille, these, you can write one, two, three, I think five lines on a note card. And it might be just five pointers that you may need for giving a speech, like a five paragraph speech. You could have just that thing or a name like during a convention when you're listening to something you can practice your braille just on these note cards and it's really handy because you can flip it over and then you can write on the opposite uh, a line off of everything so these note card slates or small slates you know especially if you're just beginning braille it's something neat to have because it's not as intimidating as an eight and a half by 11 slate that you'd yeah. have to move down and transfer, but you can just take those notes. And that's what I use them for is notes. Mm -hmm. Well, and even for like a shopping list, if you just abbreviated with using that, like BR for bread or, you know, E for eggs, just so you have a short list that will just be a quick reminder of the things that you're wanting to pick up at the grocery store. And one thing we haven't talked about, but you definitely can develop with sight loss is your memory. And we really can develop our memory and re having to recall things is a good way of keeping it trained. For instance, if you do want to get five things from the grocery and you don't have a device, remember things in alphabetical order is one way you could do it, your ingredients. Um, you can also, when you meet people, you mindfully, when someone's introducing themselves, you, you just make little patterns of recognition in your own mind so that their name might sound similar to something or reminds you of another person. You link certain words and names and even in Australia, we use the number 04 for every mobile phone number well that because oh four you just don't have to remember that but you can try to remember the next sequence of numbers in a pattern so it's it's recognizing things in pattern and putting that into your memory oh what a great idea before we continue i just want to remind everyone that if you have a question feel free to either put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and we will uh give you the floor to speak um unmute and speak to uh, our panelists, if you'd like. So if you have comments or questions, be sure to put those in. And we, we do definitely have a few moments that we can do that. Melanie, so, this is this is Neva. And I, yes. I just want to make sure that we cover the, the access to information that often people miss a great deal when they first lose vision. And that's access to reading and reading things that they want to read, like their Bible or the newspaper, or reading things they need to read, like books about living with blindness. Um, there are a lot of them out there. The Talking Book Program uh, in the United States from the Library of Congress is completely free. The digital talking book player that comes with, uh, you know, with your membership or when you sign up, 
um, place cartridges that are mailed through the mail to you and or mailed back free of postage. Or if you have an iDevice, um, you can download onto a, um, or, or, or onto a smartphone, it's Android or uh, iPhone, where you can listen to books uh, using that device. But even before you're ready for that, the digital talking book machine has great big buttons with bright colors, with very easy to feel shapes. It's super, super easy to use. And, and that's not the only source of reading materials. There's uh, NFB has a news line that you can listen to every newspaper on the uh, on that they have on the telephone. You can get it on your computer, which we haven't even touched on using the computer, but just, just to oh, throw it out there, lot. it is possible. Um, I use a computer without a screen completely. All I use is my ears, which thankfully just work fine these days. And, and the other thing is, is that learning to use these things is, is daunting for some people. But Vision Aware has lots of great little tips and tricks about it, but also the rehabilitation services that are out there through um, either your state vocational rehabilitation agency or the Older Individuals Who Are Blind Independent Living program um, will provide training to learn hands-on how to do some of these things and to at least get you started. And Jeff mentioned Braille, which I just wanted to add that I didn't learn Braille till I was in my 40s. And I am still not a fast Braille reader, but I can read the entire code. And for me, it's, it's just been a godsend to have that in my toolkit. And um, I guess the, the final you know, idea I'd like to leave people with is as you put these things in your toolkit, like the rubber bands or the um, the, the pen friend or the way around or the talking book is that you that you you think of adding them to your repertoire as adding them to your toolkit and that you do them one or two at a time that you don't sign up for six or seven different things or you don't buy 20 different things out of the catalog because what's going to happen is you're going to be overwhelmed and you're never going to master any of it try one or two things, make the changes, incorporate them into your life, make them every day so they're as, as normal as breathing, and then add something new. And that way you'll make changes that will be positive and will be long lasting. Excellent points. We have one hand that is raised. Let's see if I can successfully do this. <laughs> uh, it, it is area code 517. I'm going to ask you to unmute and you can feel free to hop in with your question. If you'd introduce yourself, please. Hi, hi Melody. My name is Roberta. I live in Michigan and I just wanted to toss in a few ideas that I've collected over the last hour and 15 minutes. Wonderful ideas. Um, one is about using a rug, about a throw rug. Um, I use a throw rug to identify the top of the stairs in my house. I live in a split level home. And I so I have a small throw rug right in the front of my stairs to let me know if I touch that rug, you may need to be careful. You're at the point of no return if you take another step. Hmm. Um, the other thing is, I really like the idea of labeling using things that are already available to people. Um, I find it helpful to remember that no label is a label. So the first item of, of any group of confused items gets no label. So for me, it's like, okay, shampoo is like, it's there. Then the next thing that comes into my shower is cream rinse. So that gets a rubber band. But the shampoo with no label means something as well. Um, and the other thing is, um, Location can mean something. Hmm. So we didn't talk about medications, but for me, medications are labeled by, identify them by where they're located in my house. So something next to my bed is a pill that I take first thing in the morning. And because I'm half asleep, I put the bottle under my pillow. So when I come back out of the bathroom, I know I took it. Hmm. So those are just some ideas I wanted to add to the mix. And thank you for this program. It's been wonderful. 
Well, thank you very much, Roberto. I appreciate your comments. Those are all excellent uh, additions. Um, I did see one other question come in that I think uh, we have time to um, talk about. It is, how do you arrange your closet and match colors for outfits? That's a really great question. Who wants to tackle it? I can talk about that because I do love clothes. <laughs> for me, <laughs> I know everybody's taste is different, but for me, the easiest way is to keep it simple. Um, as far as like my bottoms go, um, I tend to buy colors that are neutral, that if I'm wearing a top, it will kind of go with whatever, no matter what the print is or what the color is. So like a dark denim, I have some light denim, um, maybe some white or, um, you know, khaki or, or whatever that, or black, you know, I keep those pretty simple. Um, the same thing with my shoes. I keep them, you know, like neutral colors or, or like a black or whatever. And then um, I don't really organize them in a specific way. I mean, I definitely have like my winter clothes and my summer clothes, but um, for my tops, I feel like there's a little bit more of a free reign if my pants are, um, you know, all just like solid colors. I mean, if people want vibrant colors, whenever I go shopping um, and I'm looking for stuff, if my shopping assistants, whoever is with me, I'll have them describe it to me and then I will feel it, like feel the sleeves, feel the texture, feel the shape of it feel the style of it and then just kind of commit that to memory to know whenever you come across it like okay this is this is sh this shirt and you have an idea in your head of of what it looks like and then um you know with dresses and stuff you really don't need to worry about matching other anything other than your shoes and again that kind of goes back to just like kind of keeping them you know simple and stuff like that but that's my um biggest thing is just having the basics and then expounding upon the basics in in that way does anybody else do anything differently? Yes, yeah, so just I have a couple of outfits if I'm in a hurry that are, you know, ones I want to wear out that I will store the actual necklace with the coat hanger of that outfit so that I don't have to be feeling things going, oh, I wonder if that matches, I wonder if that matches. And um, that's a very quick way of knowing, okay, this whole outfit is on one hanger. So it's the skirt, the top, the slight jacket and the necklace that can sit there and I know that's ready to go in a quick way. That saves so much headache. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I used Roberta's uh, technique when uh, I have the habit of buying uh, things that I like in multiple colors. So I had black pants and navy pants that felt exactly the same. And uh, so no pin navy, NN no pin navy was how I knew which ones were navy. And then my black ones had a safety pin pinned into the tag. When um, it got to a point where I couldn't use the technique that um, was described where, you know, you check it out and oh yeah, you commit it to memory. Uh, Cause when you get old, you can't do that. <laughs> Just <laughs> here to tell you, especially when you go out and buy a whole weekend's worth of shopping and it's a big, huge bag, you get home and you're like, yeah, I wonder if that was the salmon shirt. Yeah. Or the pink shirt. Yeah. So um, the way around uh, labeling system that I was talking about has buttons that I sew on the inside seam. And the neat thing about way around, whereas I, I, I love the pen friend too that Maribel described, but you have to record everything in one chunk. And with way around, you can organize your information to say red polo shirt, um, but then you can also add washing instructions. You can put the date you bought it so that, um, you know, you can think, oh gosh, this is five years old. This is probably looking ratty. I should have somebody look at this. Um, you can put, uh, you know, uh, the information about where you bought it. Uh, if you want to replace it, if you're like me, a creature of habit who wants to, you know, buy the same things that they like over and over. Great. Uh, real quick, we're getting uh, closer. We're, we've got about 10 minutes and there is a, another question I want to um, ask you about, but uh, well, there are, there are two questions, but first uh, someone asked about uh, accessing Jeff's iPhone 101 program. Jeff, do you have uh, any kind of quick uh, tips that you can give people on how to get that information? You can go to www.blindabilities.com and there's a category. You can look up iPhone 101 or you can just do a search and that'll get you and it'll populate everything right down the line. Okay. 
And are those um, audio recordings? Or is those it are podcasts that you can play right through your, you know, whether an Android or the iPhone. There's also the Blind Abilities app that you can download for free, and they'll be all be right there, so you can get them that way too. Or you can ask your okay. smart device to play. Um, I don't know if you can do specific if you know the number, but the easiest way is just to go on to the either the website or use your iPhone and subscribe to the podcast, and then you can do a search and you'll find them. And that's something we didn't talk about the smart devices that much, the Amazon Echo and the uh, Google Home. Those have been quite handy uh, for me personally, and I suspect that a lot of people um, get those um you know, use those as well. But I want to, in the last few moments that we have, a question came in about how can you feel more comfortable traveling outdoors? Um, if you, a couple of you could take a couple of minutes to talk about that, and then we'll have a few minutes to wrap up. Know where the sun is. <laughs> it, it rises in the east and sets in the west. And if you're not walking at high noon, you know, you got a sense of direction. Pay attention to the wind. That type of thing is what I use for natural uh, information that's already available to me. I'd love to hear from Amy because she's written a lot about this with her white cane. Yeah, well, I just, I use my cane and I, I, uh, I go across and I try to stay on the sidewalk uh, or, or I use the um, textures to get, to get there. And I usually, use familiar routes i map out routes and so i begin to feel very comfortable where i'm going so it's the texture of of the landscape that i use and and my cane so the tip of my cane so i'm and so amy you're saying that you can feel the difference then between yes the sidewalk and the grass right mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. and yeah so if like if you're crossing a driveway you find that it's a much wider and so and if it's rough you're on the road and you get back off so i find that the, the the texture helps a lot and the sound of what you're hearing mm -hmm. helps to keep me comfortable and oriented to where i'm going I and the other sorry i just wanted to say that i think that you know backing up a half a step from using your cane to do that is, is learning to use a cane and orientation and mobility exactly. training that's available from um, agencies around the country and around the world yes. uh, to, to teach people basic orientation and mobility skills as well as uh, human or sighted guide, you'll also hear it called, so that when you're walking with somebody, you're safer and they know how to help you. You know how to tell them to help you best. And that's all learned through working with an orientation and mobility specialist. So true. And you also find that when you're in a shopping area, you'll be using your sense of smell because you'll pass a shop that's yes. familiar, like even the bakery. And you might think, right, I know that very soon after this is going to be the, uh, the other store that I want or the bookshop so smells like print books. So mm -hmm. you start to pick up these scents, become more uh, sensitive to the smells and sounds around you. And I found out. But no, go ahead, yeah. silence when i when i come to a stop i'll just stop and just listen especially at a street corner i might go through mm -hmm. a cycle just to figure things out but if i'm in a neighborhood and i can't figure anything out if i stop and just be quiet for a while i'll pretty soon be able to pick up the highway or pick up a certain road that's busier than others or a church bill or a sprinkler that I passed before. So if I have to backtrack, I'll go towards that sprinkler. You know, all these little noises that used to be just white noise are now this new white, white noise, or you just develop this other level of stuff you don't have to pay attention to. But the white right. noise that you used to just walk past all the time is now that's so much data, so much information that you can utilize. And I wonder real quickly if anyone has a word about just conquering that fear of of stepping outside the home when you are fearful about getting lost or getting hurt. Yes. Starting small. Start with your own neighborhood before yes. you just venture off to the mall and do something. Start with your own driveway and navigating right in front of your house and just go from there. Get comfortable with that and then, you know, branch out from there. Don't try to take a huge leap all at once. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
What's that song? Put one foot in front of the other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Plant we a have... really lovely, bright daisy bush at the front of your house and you'll know, oh, that's my home. There you go. Like or there's lots of little things we can do. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah. I'm going to take that one. Uh, <laughs> we have four minutes left. I want to give each of you um, just an opportunity to share any final thoughts about taking these practical first steps to independence when you're new to vision loss? Well, I might as well start and we'll go around that way. My, my real top advice is be kind to yourself. It, it is scary. Just go, what, like we said, one step at a time, but be kind to yourself. And it's okay to make mistakes. You will develop techniques that work for you. We've shared things that work for us. But when you, you just will have good and bad days, and on those bad days, just maybe stay home, look after yourself. It really is about self-care and manage that fear and don't take on too much at once. Excellent. I'd say for me, the biggest trick is trick is keeping things simple, whether it's the technology that I use or, you know, like the clothes that I buy or buying makeup or, or whatever, just keeping things simple. Um, it really helps to eliminate a lot of the clutter. I mean, we don't want things with a whole bunch of extra buttons whenever we need to stop play and fast forward, you know, and whether, when it's just, just keeping things as basic as possible usually works best for us, especially as technology is moving forward and things are becoming more and more complicated for visually impaired users with touch screens and stuff like that. Just keeping things simple works best. I think one of the most important things, and this comes through experience, is there is no one device out there that's going to solve everything, yeah. even though they may claim that it'll do it. And just because it costs more money doesn't mean it's better or anything. Like Miranda just said, keep it simple. Learn what works. Talk to others. Like you, you yeah. listen to us. None of us have or use the same techniques to do any of this stuff. We kind of intersect like the Olympic rings. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. we overlap, sometimes we don't. But what you do will be what works for you. And that's the most important thing. If it works for you, then you got it. Use Absolutely. it, you know, and then share it with someone else. Maybe they'll like to hear it. Anything else? Yeah. And I think to start small, you know, and become familiar with different ways of, of doing things and be patient with yourself. And I'll, you know, also praise yourself for what you accomplish. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that you feel good about the strides that you're making. And it's not all going to be done in a day. You know, you just really need to be uh, slow down and, you know, just be as people have said, more methodical, more purposeful, and also dialogue with people, tell them what you're feeling. And, you know, it's hard. It was hard at first for me to do that. But now I, I, I'm very good at that, communicating with my family. It's mostly my brother now. And telling them, and I even started telling shopkeepers when they tell me it's here or there, and I ask them for directional language. So, I think as you become more familiar, then you can add more and more, but keep it small at first. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. We are down to time now. So I just want to, I will give our, our, our closing code just in a moment. I want to thank everyone for coming today. I want to thank our panelists. You guys have been amazing wonderful ideas, so much um, wisdom and knowledge in this room. And I just really appreciate you guys taking the time to be here with us. And I'm sure our audience does too. And to our audience, I just want to thank you also for being here. Make sure that you can uh, go and check out aphconnectcenter.org forward slash webinars to see other webinars that we'll be having. We have another one coming up on the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is July 26th. It is going to be on self-advocacy when you're new to vision loss. It is with the author, Hannah Fairbairn. So just putting that out there, since you are registered for this, you will get an email about it. No worries at all. So again, thank you all so very much. We are having a lot of good comments coming in, you guys. And uh, everyone stay safe.
and we will see you next time.